Hello, brothers and sisters of Christ. We're in part two. Doctrines of devils. We're in 1 Timothy chapter 4. We're still on verse 1 and 2. Okay? We're going to be talking about doctrines of devils. We're going to go through some doctrines. I'm going to just throw some few verses out. Um, in, the, in the description, I'm going to try to link playlists that have a lot of studies. But remember, 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. It takes study. I can just say it and throw a couple verses out, but to really get it in your heart, so you're standing, and we'll read it real quick. Chapter 4, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Now, if you're studying to show thyself approved and you're standing firm and you've got it seated hardcore in your heart, comparing scripture with scripture, you're not going to depart from the faith. Okay? But sin, we talk about sin. However, sin can get someone to fall away. Sin for a season. But ultimately, that's why we say study, study, study. So I, I just want to say again, reiterate, I'm just throwing out, sometimes it seems like a lot of scriptures on some of these. It's actually not. There's tons of scriptures to prove these doctrines that the Bible teaches and preaches. You can have this open for 1 Timothy 4, but we've got so much to go through, I'm just going to be reading it through here, and, we might, and we'll be referring to what we're doing the expository study on. So the first thing I want to talk about is the Bible version issue. You say, is that a doctrine? Uh, the Word of God, trusting the Word of God, and believing in the Word of God. Okay? Um, I want to read through a lot of these, and then I want to show some books. So, Matthew 24, 35, you can turn to there, but also, you don't have to turn here, but Mark 13, 31, Luke 21, 33, three times in the four Gospels, this is mentioned. Remember we said, I, where Paul, in the last part one, where it said, where Paul's talking about, I've said this often, when something's repeated a lot, it's very important. Okay. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. It's mentioned three times in the four Gospels. It must be important. Okay. There's no perfect written word of God today in English, then how? Then that's a lie. John 14, 23 says, Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our bow with him. If there's no perfect written word of God today, you're not capable of loving Jesus Christ. And you can't prove that you love him. Okay? One of the biggest doctrines, I believe, that are being destroyed today is the Bible perversions out there. Okay? These Bible versions are pushing people to Satan. They preach an antichrist Jesus. Okay, they, they has a lighter attitude towards sin. It's just, it's wickedness. Uh, John 15, 13. Greater love hath no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friend. What's the opposite of a friend? Enemy. Okay. Ye are my friends, if you do whatsoever I command you. You can't be the friend of Jesus if you don't have the perfect written word of God in your hands today. You can't. Okay. Or in your heart. Remember, the Bible says, Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. There's times where people just had certain passages. I know because people say, what happened before? What would they have before the King James Bible? They still had scripture before the King James Bible. Even if it was just John chapter 1 or this chapter, and they'd read certain parts and, and little pieces of paper, and they would hide them and memorize them and put them in their hearts. Okay. But if you don't have God's perfect written word, it's just you get to choose and pick and choose what Bible perversion you want to use. That's a doctrine of devils. Um, Psalms 119.11, I read that one. The word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Okay? Without God's perfect written word in your heart, how are you supposed to keep from sin? Psalms 119.9 says, What's whither? Where withal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word? You're not capable of cleansing your way if we have no perfect written word of God today. John 17, 17 says, Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. Once again, you can't be sanctified if we don't have the truth. If we don't have the word of truth. Here's a big one, 2 Timothy 4, 2. Preach the word. I listened to Peter Ruckman. I love how he says this. 
2 Timothy 4.2 Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering doctrine. What? Preach something you don't have? I remember him saying that. It's like he, and it just strikes right home and hits right to the heart. He's right. How can you preach the word of God when you don't have it? How can I preach the word of God to you if I don't have it? I know Peter Reckham said that, but it's just, it's truth. I can't even learn and grow as a Christian as if I don't have the word of God. And this is the part... Um, these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know ye have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. If there was no perfect written record, you weren't, ca you're not capable of believing in Jesus Christ. All this should be sinking in. But here's the big one: First Thessalonians two thirteen. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing. Because when you received the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as in truth the word of God, which affectionately worketh also in you that believe. You have to believe. You have to be saved and have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will guide you into all truth. But you have to believe that this is God's perfect written word. And just because I don't understand it, or I find something that I think contradicts, just because I don't understand it, doesn't mean it's false. Okay. Now, the Bible perversions, it's been proven, they do contradict. It's been proven time and time again. All the attacks on the King James Bible, I might not be able to answer everything right away, but there's been brethren out there that they've written books, and they've studied the Bible version issue, and they've found out that this is God's perfect written word, the King James Bible. It's God's perfect written word for the English-speaking people. And all the attacks on here, this contradicts here, that contradicts here, this, that, it's all been answered by men who follow 1 Thessalonians. They believe it's God's perfect written word. They study it. The Holy Spirit's in them and shows them, okay, it's not a contradiction. Okay. Now, here's the biggest thing. Without even getting into Scripture, let's see if I do it right, okay. Without even getting into Scripture, you have the Texas Receptus, which I bought a Texas Receptus. I didn't buy Nestle's Elan. What I have here is the New Greek uh, the New Testament in Greek by Westcott and Horth. This is before the Nestle's Halon, which the Nestle's Halon was based off of. Okay? This is old. Very old. But you got these two. Greek manuscripts, Greek manuscripts. This is, we used, to, we used to say this was backed by 95%. Then you did the study a little bit more, and it got up to 99% of all Greek extant manuscripts line up with the Texas Receptus. This translation right here. Less than 1% line up with the Nestle's Elan, the uh, West Cotton Hort. Less than 1%. Now, you say, well, then I want this book, right? Okay, that's a good thing. That's smart. I mean, just, it's common sense. It's smart. You want the one, this is, I always tell people you have two things of gold, two bars that look like gold. This one's over 99% solid gold. This one is junk metal and it's less than one percent gold plated you have a debt that you have to pay which bar do you want the smart person would say i want this bar All right but you got people that aren't too smart and i'm not trying to be mean i'm just saying you still have people that after you tell them this they still want this over here the the junk metal that's just less than one percent gold plated so if you say from this study you're watching this and you're just now learning about the Bible perversion issue, the Bible version issue, perversion, and you say, well, I want that then. If I'm telling the truth, you have to study 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved. You have to research things and study things, make sure I'm telling the truth. Even if it was 95%, and people say it's not 99%, it's 95 this is 95% gold, this is less than 1%. Okay, still, what would you choose? You say, I choose this one. Okay. The King James Bible is where the Texas Receptus translation. It's the only book that's 100% Texas Receptus. It's the only Bible that's condemned by the Catholic Church. And a lot of false religions out there. The Mormons, they use it to draw people in, and then they draw them. I don't have the books with me, but I have them somewhere. Uh, Pearl of Great Price, the Mormon book, and all this stuff, and all their books, that's their true religion, like I said, when they come to the door, I talked about this in part one, when they come to the door, they're going to lie to you.
They'll come to the door with this King James Bible like they're King James Bible believers and they're lying to you. They go off for all these other books that contradict and go against the Bible. This teaches that Jesus is God. Their other books teach that Jesus is just a created being and him and Satan are brothers. It goes against the King James Bible. So you say, well, about Mormons, they're lost and on their way to hell. You believe that Jesus is a created being and he's just a brother of Satan? You're lost and on your way to hell. Doctrines of devils, doctrines of devils. That's what we're reading about. But that's what the Texas Receptus is. This, the Nestle's Alon, I don't have the Nestle Alon, but just say the Nestle's Alon because this was a precursor to the Nestle's Alon. Less than 1%, all other Bibles are off of this. You say, what about a New King James? A New King James is half and half. What does the Bible talk about? Having a little leaven, le leaven the whole lump. I'm going to put a little bit of poison in with good stuff, and it should be okay, right? No, you're still going to die. You need 100% good, not half and half. The New King James was a transition book to get people away from God's perfect written word, the King James Bible, to 100% this. How do I know? I was a false convert most of my life. The first Bible I ever had was a New King James, and it didn't take long for them to get that out of my hands and get an NIV into my hands. And I think I had a New American Standard, and I had the Message Bible. I went to, I, I regret this to tell people, I went to Bible College. And it was just such a waste, and so much lies and deception there. Right? I'm trying to be honest with you. This right here is a Dewey Reams Bible. This came out before the King James Bible came out. What happened? I don't know... Like I said, I'm just talking because I didn't really put a lot of information in this, but look it up for yourself. The Guy Fox plot, they tried to prevent the King James Bible from coming out. The Jesuits tried to blow up Parliament to kill King James to prevent the King James Bible from coming out. When they failed, because God was protecting this book, they tried to come out with their own Bible that was rejected by the people. This that's based off this, less than 1%. And then from this, they start spawning all these Bible perversions, the NIV, the NASV, and I, there's just so many of them out there. The Message, uh, the New Living Translation, the New New NIV, then the New 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 NIV, <laughs> you know, always has to change. They've always got to correct it. They've always got to fix it. It's never perfect. They're constantly updating it. All right. Um, so the first thing that we talk about here that I want to just get out right away is the doctrine of absolute truth. I have absolute truth right here in my hands. It's called the King James Bible for English speaking people. This is God's perfect written word. I learned the Bible version issue when I was a false convert and through the Bible version issue and realizing, okay, this is God. I came to it and finally said, okay, the evidence is there. This is absolute truth. This is God's word. This is God's book. Now, God, what do I do now? That's when he was able to show me the true plan of salvation. And I was able to be broken and come to God broken. Okay. Um, how is this being perverted? Because all everything we talk about, how is this being perverted to doctrines of devils? Because that's what we're talking about. The Bible version issue. Remember Genesis 3.1? I read it before. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said. That's how you pervert absolute truth, the doctrine of absolute truth. Yea, hath God said. Who really knows what God said? It could be anything. That's why there's so many different versions out there. They all say something different. Who's to know what God said? Yea, hath God said. That's how they're perverting it, the doctrine of absolute truth. Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the tree of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye, not, ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods. There's the second part. Knowing good and evil. 
So it starts out with, yea, as God said, to get you to question, what did God really say? Then ye can be as gods. You can say what God says. You're your own final authority. That's how they corrupt and turn it into doctrines of devils. And that's what all these Bible perversions are about. Yea, hath God said, and ye can be gods, knowing good and evil. And you can read sometime in uh, Revelation the consequences for um, adding to and subtracting from the Word of God. Mark 8.33 But when he had turned about and looked on his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, Get thee behind me, Satan. Why is he saying this? I've already did a study on this. Because Satan was denying the word of Jesus. He was denying the word of God. When you see people who say there is no perfect written word of God, and they try to act Christian and talk like a Christian, but they're saying there's no perfect written word of God, get thee behind me, Satan. Why? For thou savest not the things that be of God, God's perfect written word, but the things that be of men, men's words, men's opinions. We'll get to one of those verses where it talks about the wisdoms, the words of the wisdoms of men, and not the words of God. Okay, when we read about the fall, uh, what causes people not to go after Christ, when you become spoiled after the rudiments of the world. Okay. Uh, philosophy, vain deceit, after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Okay? Get thee behind me, Satan. Why? Because thou savest the things that, not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men, the world. When you get people, it's just, the, brother, sister, Christ, the reason I started with this one is because if you can't talk somebody and, and lead them to the King James Bible as God's perfect written word, at that point, other than preaching the gospel to them, there's no point in talking to them about any of the other doctrines, about anything else in the Bible. If, if they don't believe that this is God's perfect written word, and they're using Bible perversions and using any Bible they choose, there's no point in talking to them. You just need to preach the plan of salvation that's found in the scriptures, and it's between them and God. Okay. Which brings me to the next doctrine, the changed life gospel the faith alone crowd hates that. Change life gospel. Okay. Repentance. Okay, We're going to go through them just real quick, and then we're going to talk about how they like to pervert it and turn it into doctrines of devils. That's perverting it. Okay. So understand, first of all, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Okay. There's none righteous, no, not one. I understand that. When you get to that point that my life is just a mess, I've sinned against God. That's when you're, I've sinned against God and you're, you have sorrow in your heart. Remember, you have the love of pleasures more than the love of God. Your heart is about loving. I want to do another whole study on this, but called um, change of mind or change of heart. Is repentance a change of mind or is it a change of heart? Your heart loves your flesh and it's about pleasing your flesh. When you go through repentance, your heart goes from loving your flesh and pleasing your flesh to loving Jesus Christ and trying to please Jesus Christ. And while you're loving your flesh and pleasing your flesh, you hate Jesus Christ. And then it switches around where now you hate your flesh and want nothing to do with the sinful wickedness of your flesh and you want to please God and love God. Now we said loving God is what? Keeping His Word. Okay, but we're going to get into repentance, okay? Acts 11, 18. When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles were granted repentance unto life. I read that verse because I'm going to read a couple of verses before we get to 2 Corinthians because I keep saying 2 Corinthians is just in the life of a Christian, but it doesn't have anything to do with salvation. Repentance has nothing to do with salvation. We just read there it does. Repentance unto life. Acts 20, 21. Testify both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance towards God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me see it again. Repentance towards God and faith. You need both. That's why we always preach repentance towards God. We have to, you have to repent and then you have to believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. They go hand in hand. Your heart 
goes from being for your flesh, like we just talked about, to being for God. So then when you go to believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, it comes down here to the heart. Thy word have I hid in my heart. Not the head, the heart. You can miss heaven by 13 inches. It's up here, and it never makes it down here. There's a verse that I don't know if we're going to get to, if we got to it already, but it talks about you believe and know. It's both. You have it up here and you have it down here. It comes in up here because that's where you listen. It comes up here and it's got to make its way down here. It's a change of heart. 2 Corinthians 7, 9, and here's the biggest one that proves what repentance is and how it makes repentance work when it applies to salvation, whether it's at Salvation, when it comes to life eternal, unto life, which you read, repentance unto life, or the day-to-day -day walk of a Christian when you repent. How does repentance make salvation work? Or how does, sorry, how does, what makes repentance work that leads to that salvation? 2 Corinthians 7, now, 9, Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance, for ye were made sorry after a godly manner that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. All the time, Paul's talking about false converts through uh, Corinthians. Ta we've read about, you know, from such withdraw thyselves. Okay? Let's keep reading. Be damaged by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrows of the world worketh death. Now, sorrows of the world work at death. How can you see, we talked about this, how can you tell a false convert from someone who's truly saved? The Bible says that you're supposed to bring forth, therefore, fruits, meat for repentance. That means evidence that you repented is you have fruits. The evidence on, when it comes to a Bible-believing, God-fearing Christian that God has saved, the evidence that you repented before salvation is the changed life after salvation. Your heart's desire is about pleasing God and loving God. If a man love me, he will keep my words. That's what it means to love Jesus Christ. You no longer love your flesh, and you're not just obeying your flesh's word. You're now obeying God's word, and there's a changed life. Guaranteed. But what's the evidence? Verse 11. For behold, this selfsame thing that ye sorrowed after a godly sort, what carefulness it wrought in you, yea, what clearing of yourselves, yea, what indignation, yea, what fear, yea, what vehement desire, yea, what zeal, yea, what revenge, and all things ye have approved yourself to be clear in this matter. Now I already put it down here, Matthew 3, 8, is bring forth, forth therefore fruits meet for repentance. Okay? Repentance is part of the plan of salvation. It's the first step. You come to God as a sinner. And you have a heartfelt desire. Your heart goes from being a lover of pleasures more than lovers of God to being lovers of God more than lovers of pleasures. I'm pointing at my flesh over here, trying to do two things. Okay, my flesh versus God. Okay. Next is belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. So, Second Corinthians five fifteen, and that He died for all that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. I had to throw that in there real quick as we're heading to the belief. Repentance is how you can have that heartfelt conviction of, I believe in what Jesus did for me. I know what I was. I have sorrow for it. I hate my flesh. I hate sin now. Lord, what, I'm going to hell. I deserve to go to hell for sinning against you. Lord, what do I do? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. 1 Corinthians 15, 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. I already did a big study on this, the believing in vain there. What's it talking about? People can profess to believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, but with the life they're living, they can deny the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The old man is supposed to be dead and buried with Jesus Christ. The new man, the new woman, is raised with Jesus Christ. Oh, I believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, but do you live a life that proves that? 
The changed life is what proves it. And people still fight me on that. Okay? That's how you can believe in vain. Verse 3, but I did a whole study on it. Just want to throw that in there real quick. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. How that Christ died. How did He die? Uh, Isaiah 53, 5. But He was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon Him, and with His stripes we are healed. He bled out. He was whipped. He was beaten. With, I mean, just... just Within an inch of his life, he had his beard ripped out. He was nailed and staked to a cross. And he bled out. Right? That belief is there. And he did that to pay for the sins of the world. Not your... Uh, people always say, when they go to preach the plan of salvation, he died for your sins personally. No, he died for the sins of the world as a whole. You want your sins personally paid for? You need to go to the cross. You need to go to the cross. If you don't, you will end up having to pay for your sins at the great white throne, judgment, where God's going to say, depart from me, ye accursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. You're going to wind up in the lake of fire, paying for your sins for all eternity. Jesus paid for the sins of the world as a whole. Past tense, past event. That belief is there. Okay? People don't seem to, I mean, for the most part, all these different um, false gospels, they seem to line up with the belief and it just sticks to the belief and they skip repentance. They skip the next part we're going to talk about, confess both in prayer. They skip asking God to save you. They say asking God to save you is a work. Prayer is a work. All right? But I'm getting ahead of myself because that's when we get to talk about how they pervert it. But that's the belief, what Jesus did on the cross. He paid for the sins of the world. He paid the price that you and I were supposed to pay. What he went through, I was supposed to go through. It's a heartfelt thing to, to have that in your head and in your heart saying, I should have gone through that. And I and one some people mocked me, brothers and sisters of Christ. Some people mocked me when I did a study way back when when I was talking about you have those false converts that they're all about whipping Jesus. Just whip him again, whip him again. Being those people that were mocking him while he's on the cross. Throw rocks at him, throw dirt on him, spit on him. You have all those people that do that. These faith alone, easy believism people. And they were mocking that. And it's like, it's a heartfelt thing. It's a change of heart. What he went through, I should have went through. I should have had people spitting in my face. Throwing dirt at me. You know. Whipping me. Beating me. Ripping my beard out. Right? you got to get to that broken, heartfelt conviction. So that belief is not just head knowledge, it's believing. It's down here in the heart. The next part is confess both in prayer. The Bible talks about that. Romans 10, 8. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. Notice it says it's nigh thee, even in thy mouth. I didn't, get, I didn't have to get told this to a point. Okay, I, it's the moment that I've repented in my heart, starts up here, I repented in my heart, and I believed in my heart, I just told the Lord. You don't have to speak out loud, but I told the Lord, Lord, I'm nothing. Okay? That's what it's talking about, it's even nigh, you're going to want to do it. When you truly get, are getting saved by God, you're going to want to say, Lord, and confess your repentance and your belief, and ask God to save you. You're going to want to do it. It's, it's just second nature to someone who truly gets saved. How many brothers and sisters of Christ out there can testify to what I'm saying? Okay. Verse 9. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. It's a Bible condition. If it's required as the plan of salvation, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. The heart. It's always going to be about the heart. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Unto means it comes before. Unto salvation. For the scripture saith, whoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. And that's ultimately what it is. All these people who say you don't confess both in prayer, you don't say, 
you know, ask God to save you, they're ashamed. Why? Because they're still living a life of the world. They're not living a life of Christ. They're not going after Christ. They're still living a life of the world. They're all about pleasing the flesh, loving the flesh. And they're ashamed. Mm -hmm. But it says here, it comes before salvation. So when you get saved, you're confessing to the Lord. This all happens at once. It happens. It's not a cleaning up, but your life changes afterwards. God will clean up your life after He saves you. Not before, after. But all this happens almost simultaneously. Right? It's not something that happens over a three-week period. It's simultaneously. Okay? You finally get to a broken point. You get told the truth. It just starts going down like clockwork. Like dominoes. Right? You hit the You come broken. Lord, what must I do? He brings someone into your life to tell you the, the gospel. You confess both in prayer. And lastly, you ask God to save you. If you keep going, uh, we're going to keep going in Romans 10, verse 12. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich upon all that call upon Him. Remember we read about how God's... Um, see if I can find it. Lord, here it is, Titus 2.11, how we read in the last study, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. We're reading there, it says, For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich, upon, uh, rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Why is that so hard for some people, brothers and sisters in Christ? I ask God to save me. When you ask God, God to save you, you're saying, I don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. I'm worthless. I deserve to go through what Jesus went through. I deserve that. I don't deserve to be saved. I'm worthless. Oh Lord, please save me. Why is that so hard for some people? Well, as we're reading there, some shall depart from the faith, 1 Timothy 4, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Okay. And then real quick, uh, getting ahead of myself, after salvation, okay, this is after salvation, 2 Corinthians, you don't have to turn because I'm going to read it real quick, 2 Corinthians 5.17, therefore if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, old things have passed away, behold, all things become new. Why does it say all? Because your heart goes from loving and wanting to please you. Your heart's here, and then your flesh. I'm just trying to do the difference, okay? Your heart goes from loving and pleasing your flesh to loving and pleasing God. And when that happens, all things, all things become new. Everything becomes about 100% about Jesus Christ. You give God thanks in everything. You give God glory in everything. Everything you do, you make sure that it pleases God. It's about obeying His Word. Your whole life becomes 100% about Jesus Christ. You're in the world, but you're not of the world. You're separate. We read in the uh, first uh, part of the study about setting an example for the brethren. We're not supposed to be like the lost world. Galatians 6.15 For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. There's that spiritual circumcision of the heart. It gets circumcised from the body, the heart gets circumcised from the flesh, and it's no longer about the flesh, it gets connected to Jesus Christ, and now your soul is connected to Jesus Christ. I did that study where it talks about body, soul, and spirit. Okay? How there's no line between spirit and, and soul because you're spiritually dead, and your body is connected to your soul, so when your body sins, it affects the soul. And you're not connected to Jesus Christ. That spiritual circumcision is you get cut and you're no longer your, your uh, soul, your heart, is no longer connected to your flesh. It's not about the flesh. It gets connected to Jesus Christ and then your spirit gets connected as far as becoming spiritually alive. I did that study talking about it, okay? A new creature. This happens after salvation. The don't fall for what it says here in 1 Timothy 4, chapter 2, speaking lies and hypocrisy when people say that we say you have to clean up your life to be saved. No, it happens afterward because only God can truly clean up your life. Only God can do what He did in my life, cleaning up my life. 
I was just wicked sinner, filthy, rotten, low down, no good sinner. My life was just worldly and just worthless. It took Jesus Christ to clean up my life and give me worth. Giving me a purpose. Remember we talked about that in part one? Paul's talking about a purpose. Jesus gave me a purpose. Mm -hmm. Ephesians 2.8 The faith alone crowd lives to read 8 and 9, but they hate 10. Let's read. Ephesians 2.8 For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship. We created in Christ Jesus unto good works. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. It's this passage. Which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. And I've said this tons of times again, brothers and sisters of Christ, and I'll say it again. A Bible believing, God fearing Christian is going to say, My heart's desire is no longer for the flesh, my heart's desire is for the Lord to please him. I need to be walking in these. Someone who's a false convert is always going to focus on the should. It just says should. It just says should. A person who's truly saved and born again and wants to follow and wants to please God is going to say, I want to walk in them. I need to make sure I'm walking in them. The should is there to show us that we're going to fall flat on our face. Recently I did. There's times you're going to fall flat on your face. You're going to fail the Lord. You're going to sin. When you get saved, you're not sinlessly perfect. You're still a sinner, it's just you are a saved sinner, and you go from loving sin and justifying sin to struggling with sin and fighting sin and saying just like it is. I sinned recently, I was 100% wrong, it was my fault, I let the Lord down, I was chastised of the Lord, He picked me back up, I repented, forsaked, and got back to serving the Lord. But you got people that focus on the should, should, may. That's just there to show us that we're still sinners and we're still going to screw up sometimes and we're still going to fall flat on our face. But a man whose heart is for the Lord and their desires for the Lord, it's going to be focused on, I want to walk in them. Now I'm going to need to make sure I'm walking in them. Okay? The changed life after salvation. That's what true Bible-believing, God-fearing men preach. Men and women, when we're part of the ministry of reconciliation, that's the gospel, the plan of salvation that we preach. Now, what does Satan do? He comes along and perverts it into doctrines of devils and gets people to follow doctrines of devils instead of the doctrine of the true plan of salvation, the changed life gospel. It's found in the scriptures. Okay, repentance, how is that perverted? Let me see. This starts to go on to the next page. How does repentance get perverted? Well, one of the biggest things I do about this ministry is, is words have meaning. They change the definition of repentance. Repentance is having a change of heart and it's godly sorrow for your personal sins towards God. First, you're not sorry at all. You love your sin, you love your flesh, you're pleasing your flesh. And you go to hating your flesh, hating that sin, and it's a change of heart, and it's godly sorrow for your personal sins that you've sinned against God. You come to that broken state where you are just sorry for your sinful state and what you've done. And acknowledging that you're, it's wrong, you're a sinner, and that you're on your way to hell and you deserve to go to hell. That's true biblical repentance as it applies to salvation. Godly sorrow for your personal sins. What do they do to pervert that and turn it into doctrine of devils? Well, let's change the definition of repentance. Instead of being a change of heart, let's say it's, let's make it a change of mind. Oh, better yet, let's make it go. Let's say it's going from unbelief to belief. That's the change of mind. You see, they turn it into doctrines of devils, and you get people that start falling away, saying, "Well, maybe repentance wasn't supposed to be part of it and everything." The belief, I already talked about how sometimes it's, they, they make it so simple. It's, they simplify it to the point where it's not that big of a deal. Some people pervert the belief because they say Jesus could have died anyway. He could have been strangled and it could have meant anything. There's some people, I guess, that are starting to preach a crossless gospel. Okay, there's different ways that they are really trying to pervert the gospel today. Right? But ultimately, belief, 
this faith alone, they turn faith into works, so then you've earned salvation. It's no longer what Jesus did, it's what you did. You've earned salvation, so now you can live however you want to live. It's faith alone. That's the biggest way I've seen it perverted today. Okay? The Bible says you need to repent and believe. you got to do both. They take repentance out completely, and it's just belief. Faith. Faith alone. Faith alone. Faith alone. I'm saved by my faith. And we just read there in Second um, Ephesians... Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, that you're saved by God's grace. God saves you. That's why you ask God, God, I don't deserve it. Will you please save me, Lord? Please save me. God does the saving. You're not saved by your faith. They like to switch that around. Say, instead of saying, for by grace are you saved, they like to say, for by faith are you saved through grace. They won't actually say it, but the life they're living, that's exactly what they're saying. That's why Paul had to go and say, are we supposed to sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How are we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Because of those people. Paul was talking to the Corinthians. Because a lot, I believe half of them, if not more, were false converts. And the ones that were saved are getting messed up and falling away from the faith. Okay. They take out confessing both in prayer. They just take it out. You don't have to confess anything. That's works. Prayer is a work. And then you show them all the scriptures where prayer is not a work. Okay. It's, it's not a gift. That's one of them. It's not a gift. I didn't put this in my notes, but it's not a gift if you ask for it. So asking God to save you, it's not a gift. Well, Jesus at the well with the woman said, if you knew the gift that I had to offer, you would have asked me for living water. That living water. Yes, you can ask for something and it still be a gift. So we show that to them and they just ignore it. They ignore scripture. Okay? But the doctrines of devils. Okay? They no change life. They pervert the true doctrine of God with doctrines of devils saying there's no change life. It's just head belief. You just say you believe. Sometimes it's just you say a little prayer and you go about living your wicked, wicked life apart from God, worldly, and just call yourself a Christian. They pervert, pervert, pervert. And that's what Paul's warning and saying that, brethren that are in ministry, if you're watching this, we need to be standing for the true plan of salvation. I know you do. But to the people out there, brothers and sisters of Christ, and if there's lost people watching, that's why we're hardcore about this. I want to see people go to heaven. I don't want to see people go to hell. Hell and, and the lake of fire was prepared for the devil and his angels. It wasn't prepared for us. You don't have to go to hell. I don't want anybody to go ahead. I take no pleasure in telling someone they're lost and they're on their way to hell. Okay? It's not something I just get pleasure out of. Right. But you have people that will pervert it, and we're being told we need to stand. And this is why people in the latter times are faith, are departing from the faith and giving heed to seducing spirits. They're being told and seduced by, hey, you can keep your sin. That's all these, the no change life gospel, all these false plans of salvation. It's all so you can have your sin, you can have this world, and go. And they tell you you can go to heaven when you die. You know, insurance, you can go to heaven when you die, but you can just have your sin. Sin for a season. Yea, hath God said, ye can be as gods. That's what they offer them with these false plans of salvation. There's no changed life. You don't have to obey God's word. It says should. It doesn't say you have to. That's what we're putting up with, brothers and sisters Christ, and that's what it's... It's tough today. I, I, I come across... I When I go out, I hardly ever go out anymore once a week, um, it's like 90 to 95% of the people, I almost want to say 100, I can't say 100 because I don't actually talk to all of them that much that well, sometimes it's just in passing, but when the people I actually talk to, like it take time to talk to them, 100% of the people I've come across that profess to be Christians around here, face to face, not on, online, with you talking with you guys, but face to face, they're false converts. They've been fed that lie that you can live however you want and do whatever you want and call yourself a Christian and go to heaven when you die. Some of them try to live a good, clean life, but they're still living a life that they want to live. They have no final authority. 
But turn to 2 Corinthians 11.1. 1. This is what was going on in Corinthians, and this is what's still going on to this very day. Okay, how does this get perverted and become a doctrine of devils, the true plan of salvation? This is ultimately it right here. 2 Corinthians 11.1. 1. Would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband that I present you that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. One plan of salvation, one way to heaven, one Jesus Christ. There's so many fake counterfeits out there, it isn't funny. That's what Paul's saying. I've preached the real Jesus Christ to you. The real plan of salvation. And someone's coming along and messing it up. Bear with me. Verse 3, so those who are saved, he's saying, bear with me. If you're saved and still following what I taught you, bear with me a little in my folly, because a lot of the Corinthians weren't following it. Verse 3, but I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety. Yea, hath God said, ye can be as gods knowing good and evil. Ye can be as gods. So your minds should be corrupt from the simplicity that is in Christ. It's not down here. It's up here. For if he that cometh preach another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit, what did we just read about here? Seducing spirits. What did we also read about? The Antichrist spirit that's in the world today. Believe, brother, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits to see whether they are of God. It's in John. 1 John. Receive another spirit, if ye receive another spirit which ye have not I'm sorry, if ye receive another spirit which ye have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. Where's Satan going? Hell. What is he saying here? There's people coming in and they're preaching another Jesus, getting people to receive another spirit, and they're preaching a different plan of salvation, a different gospel. And they're leading people to hell. That's exactly what's going on. So there's a first doctrine we talked about, Bible version issue, the doctrine of absolute truth. They're going to pervert that to doctrines of devils. We just talked about the doctrine of the true plan of salvation. The first command that you're given to obey so you can be the friend of Jesus is you're to obey the gospel. Repent, believe, Confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. Why is that so difficult for people? Simple. Sin for a season. You can be as gods. Knowing good and evil. Yea, hath God said. So they can have sin for a season. The next doctrine that we're going to touch on just a little bit is eternal security. These are doctrines that, remember, they point you to go after Jesus Christ. You can't go after Jesus Christ if you don't have His perfect written word. Okay. Remember, we talked about that. If a man love me, he will keep my words. i got to make sure to keep this study focused on those two things, going after Jesus Christ on all these doctrines. If you don't have his perfect written word, you're not capable of loving Jesus Christ. If you don't have his perfect written word, you can't obey his commands so you can be the friend of Jesus Christ. You wouldn't know the gospel, the true plan of salvation. You wouldn't know the instruction in righteousness. All scripture is given by inspiration. is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Perfect heart with the Lord, going after Jesus Christ. Absolute truth. You can't go after Jesus Christ if you don't know the real Jesus Christ. We just read there how they're preaching a different Jesus, getting people to receive a different spirit, and they're preaching a false gospel, false plan of salvation. Okay, That's what all this is about. So you're going after Jesus Christ. The next doctrine is eternal security. Okay, This one's pretty simple. 1 John 5.13 These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. You're not capable of believing without a perfect written word, and you don't even know that you're eternally secure, that you're going to heaven when you die if we didn't have a perfect written word of God. You are sealed unto the day of redemption. Okay. How does this generation pervert 
How does this get perverted? I'm sorry. How does this get perverted and become a doctrine of devils when it comes to eternal security? It's just so simple. When God saves you, it's His salvation. You're sealed into the day of redemption. You're going to heaven when you die or if you live to see the catching away of the body of Christ. You are going to heaven when you die. If God saved you. It's that simple. It's His salvation, not yours. He does the saving, not you. How does this get perverted? Well, there's a lot of ways it gets perverted. But the biggest one is they try to tell you that you can earn it. You have either have earned it with your faith... Or you have to do good works and earn salvation. You have to die in a state of grace. In other words, you have to keep doing good works until your death. And then maybe you did enough good works to outweigh the bad works to get into heaven. Okay. Ephesians 4.17 This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. It's supposed to be down here, not up here. The vanity of their mind. Having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. There it does. It's, it's coming back to the heart. It's a heart issue. Who being past feelings have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. But ye have not so learned Christ. If so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. There's the Bible if again. That ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that ye put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore put away lying, speaking every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. We are members of one of another. Be ye angry and sin not. You're allowed to be angry with a cause, and it's not a sin. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more. These are all evidence when you look in your life. Has there been a change in your life? That's the whole point of this. Has there been a change in your life? That let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the things which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. It's showing that there's. you look at your life. When you first get saved, there's going to be times where you're going to doubt your salvation. But you should get to a point where you say, Lord has really changed my life. I'm not the same man I was. The old man is dead and buried. I'm the new man, the changed life, everything's there. You should get to a point where you have that assurance of salvation. There is no, I remember Peter Ruckman used to say, well, I used to doubt my salvation for 30 seconds once a month or something like that. I can't remember what it was. All the time. He was playing to the crowd. I'm sorry, there's no other way to say it. He's playing to the crowd. You get to a point where you have assurance of salvation, and you're going to have people try to take that away from you. Doctrines of devils are going to come in and they're going to try to take that assurance of salvation. But here's the thing, verse 30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. You get to a point where you say, yes, I am saved. God saved me. I'm going to heaven when I die. My heart's desires for His word. He's changed my life. Everything we just read there. He's changed my life. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby not that you did good works to be saved, but it's evidence of repentance. We just talked about repentance. It's evidence of it. Okay, yeah, I, I'm saved. It's not just believing all the doctrines that we're talking about in your heart, just like in your head, I mean. That belief needs to be in your heart. You're living it. You're going after Jesus Christ with every aspect of your life. It's 100% about Jesus Christ. But you're not to grieve the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed into the day of redemption. Verse 31, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Why do I read all this? How do people are, are perverting and become doctrines of devils? They get you to grieve the Holy Spirit. They try to get you to doubt your salvation all the time. There's nothing wrong with me saying, hey, remember we talked about that with Paul saying, uh, you're not living righteously. You're not living. You're you're living ungodly. You're not re uh, turning your back. I can't remember if it was 
turn your back, denouncing ungodliness, renouncing ungodliness. Now you're actually starting to live ungodly. You're starting to. There's, there's nothing wrong with with a brother saying, "Hey, you're not living according to the Bible. You're not following the doctrines because you're not going after Christ. That's what the doctrines are. You're going after Christ. Sometimes you can f see people and say, "Well, you're kind of going after Satan." All right. When I was newly saved, there for a while I kept falling, falling, falling into temptation and choosing back to sin, like res trying to resurrect the old man that's supposed to be dead and buried. And it was a struggle for a while, and God had a lot of work to do with me, with me struggling with Him, <laughs> you know, struggling with my flesh, but the flesh overcome, let me allowing the flesh to win over God sometimes, and it's my fault. There was times where I doubted my salvation, but there came a point where I said, you know what, I am sealed until the day of redemption. I'm not supposed to grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Okay? And how did the doctrines come in saying, no, you have to do good works to be saved. No one knows, you can't know that you're going to heaven when you die. And I just quoted verses where he says you can. Okay? Uh, that you may know ye have eternal life. These things have I written. We have a perfect word of assurance saying that we're going to go to heaven when we die. Those who are saved and born again. The new birth. All right? But you're going to have people that come through with doctrines of devils and say, No, you can't know that you're going to heaven. No, it's, it's, not, a, it's not... How to say this? There's no, the word lordship salvation is not in the Bible. Bottom line, they'll try to tell you you have to do good works in order to be saved. You're not saved, present tense, assured that you're going to heaven, you're being saved. And my V changes that changes some of the words that you are saved to you're being saved. You know, it's a, it's a satanic Bible. Doctrines of devils. I'm sorry, I'm getting a little tired, I've been at this for hours. But brothers, this is Christ, don't let anybody come and try to steal your assurance of salvation. You've got to get to a point where you have that assurance. If you're newly saved and you're struggling with the flesh, and God still has a lot to clean up in your life, I was there. I know every brother out there that will testify, they were there at one time too, where God had a lot of cleaning up to do. And there's times where you might doubt your salvation a little bit at first. But you should get to a point where you have that assurance of salvation. And the doctrines of devils are going to get you to depart from the faith by getting you to doubt your salvation. That's one of the doctrines. One of the big doctrines that's very important is you need to understand eternal security, what eternal security is. You don't do good works, because oftentimes these people that put in that you have to do good works to be saved, the good works that they try to get you to do aren't based in Scripture. Go to a Bible building. Wear your Sunday best. Give 20% tithe. Make sure you're volunteering at that Babel building. Uh, like the Catholic Church has a lot of pagan rituals like the Eucharist and whatnot. Uh, that's not in Scripture. They're trying to steal, prevent people from getting saved. And if you're truly saved, they're trying to steal your assurance of salvation. That's the whole point when it comes to eternal security of doctrines of devils. Trying to get you to um, depart from the faith. And how they do it, they speak lies and hypocrisy. They want you to do all these good works, yet they themselves, most of the times, these people that preach, these preachers of righteousness, they're the most wicked people you, you find. When you open the closet, you'll just find all kinds of wickedness about them. They're just wicked Satanists. Perverts, sometimes. All right. Eternal security can be perverted. And then telling you, no, you're not eternally secure. You've got to do good works. The other thing I left out here is they try to teach people that you can lose your salvation. Well, if it's your salvation, then yeah, you can lose it. Anything that's mine, I can lose. But it's God's salvation, not mine. God saved me. I didn't save myself. I can't lose the salvation that God gave me, that God has. Okay? It's His salvation. So they'll try to come in and tell you, um, that you can lose your salvation. I go back to Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 and 10. We'll read it again. For by grace are you saved through faith. You're saved by God's grace. It's His salvation. God does the saving. You can't save yourself. Your faith doesn't save you. It says through faith. And I've proven it takes faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. It takes faith to repent, 
believe, confess both in prayer, and ask a God that you cannot see and have hope that He can save you. You don't deserve it, but you believe and have hope that He could save you. For our grace we save through faith and not of yourselves is a gift of God, not of works. Remember, there are always these people that speak lies and hypocrisy. They're always going to say that we teach that you have to do good works to be saved. The changed life comes after salvation. How we know this? Let's keep reading. Not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. When we get saved, it leads to good works. That's what unto is again. It, we created first, then unto good works. You get saved first, and it leads to good works. It leads to a changed life, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Now, put on here, they try to confuse you. Change life versus doing good works to be saved. They'll try to switch it around. Be careful of that, brothers and sisters in Christ, when you're preaching the plan of salvation. And if anybody's come across this that's lost, be careful. Change life comes after salvation. When people try to turn you against eternal security, they're trying to say you have to do good works before God saves you. You have to have the changed life before God saves you. No. You need to get saved first. You need to drop whatever you're doing, and if you're lost right now, you need to come to the Lord broken and get saved right now. Don't worry about cleaning up your life yet. Just come straight to the Lord broken. Repent. Believe. Confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. God will take care of cleaning up your life later. But how do they pervert things? They always like to switch things around, change definition of things. They use lying and hypocrisy to get people, and seducing spirits, to get people to fall for doctrines of devils. Okay? Don't fall for it. You are eternally secure. You should get to a point where you know that you are eternally secure. You are going to heaven when you die. The next doctrine that we're going to talk about real quick is pre-time of Jacob's trouble catching away of the body of Christ. Jeremiah 37. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. It's even the time of Jacob's trouble. Um... Give me one second, brothers and sisters. It's getting hot in here. <laughs> I have all these lights on me, and I turned the fan off so it wouldn't make a lot of noise. So I'm going to open the door real quick. But I'm wearing a sweater, and I don't want to overheat. That's a 10 pages of notes. <laughs> it's a long study. I was going to try to do it in three parts. It's like a three-hour study. So I'm trying to break it into parts. But the pre-time of Jacob's trouble, I read Jeremiah 37 to let me let us know that why is that seven-year time period called? It's called the time of Jacob's trouble. It's not called the Great Tribulation. That's one of the ways that they get you into doctrines of devils because they change the definitions or they'll change the names. That's how they get you away. So I kind of jumped ahead when I showed you how they turn it into doctrines of devils. Okay? It's called the time of Jacob's trouble. It's not post-trib, it's not mid-trib, it's not pre-trib. It's pre-time of Jacob's trouble, catching away, it's caught up, the Bible talks about, which we're going to read here. 1 Thessalonians 4.16 For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up. Okay. Together with him them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord wherefore comfort one another with these words remember I'm going to put links to playlists where you can study 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 and go through a lot of these All right. but right here we're going to be caught up and it happens before the time of Jacob's trouble 1st Corinthians 15:51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruption must put on incorruption, and this mortal shall put on immortality. 
So when this corruption shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law, the, sin of, of the law of sin and death. But thanks be to God, which giveth the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye dead, steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Remember we talked about looking for the Lord coming any day? Jesus can come any day, so we're, living, we're doing our best to live a life of Christ now, because Jesus can come back any day now. He's going to come back before the time of Jacob's trouble. And there's a lot more verses in there that talk about it. I just try to briefly go over this. This is a big study. I went over tons of videos uh, that multiple brethren have done. And it took a lot of study for me to really get a lot of it down. But like I said, this is just us going over things short, little bits here and there. But there's going to come a time, right now we are two-thirds redeemed. Our souls redeemed, our spirits redeemed. I didn't write this verse down, but the Bible talks about how we are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus right now. Our soul is in our body, and it's in heaven right now, seated in heavenly places. A soul can be in two places at once. Okay. So how do they pervert this? Well, I already told you one of them. They changed the title for the seven-year time period. They changed the title to say it's the Great Tribulation. So then all through the Bible, when it talks about us going through tribulation today, as, as uh, Christians in the church age, which is from the death of Jesus Christ to the catching away of the body of Christ, they can grab those and say, see, the church goes through the Great, the great Tribulation. They pervert it by changing the name of the title. All you do to de defeat the church going through the time of Jacob's trouble is it's called the time of Jacob's trouble. Jacob is another word for Israel. Okay, uh, Brother Brian is a great, it's one of my favorite studies that I love watching every so often. It's um, about, God, I can't remember the name now. Brain froze. But it's about God, God will not pour out his wrath. Oh, post-trib, the, the God of post-trib, I think is what it's called. And it's all the whole study is about how God will not pour out His wrath on His own body. He will not pour out His wrath on the righteous along with the wicked. And it's a great study. I love that study that God showed Brother Brian. So they'll change the title to make it about the church and not about Israel. Not about Jacob. Okay? They make it about the church and not Israel. That goes into replacement theology. That's the biggest thing that really perverts this doctrine into doctrines of devils. It's replacement theology. The church has replaced Israel. Um, rapture. They'll change words. It's caught up. If you look at the definition, caught up means the church. We're going through the church age. There's a big event that happens that causes the church to trip like it's going to fall into the seven year time period and God goes no and he catches us and says you're not going through that he catches us and brings us up says come on up and we're all happy to come thank you Lord for catching us thank you for saving us that seven year time period God's going to be pouring his wrath out on this earth okay? and it's for the Jewish people to bring them back to the Lord again now they'll change it to rapture rapture means that you're taken by violence with of a pleasing nature you're taken by force and with violence of a pleasing nature. And I look at that, I just, just that's not it at all. And I, you got to get rapture out of your vocabulary. Got to get rapture. So they, what they do is they change the title. They start changing names of the events. They start going outside the Bible using wisdom of men and their words and not God's words. Okay. There's a verse that says, In those days there shall be great tribulation, but it's not a title. It's a description. We're going to have tribulation today. Nothing like it's going to be in the time of Jacob's trouble. Absolutely not. But we're going to have tribulation today as a Christian. Uh, one of my uh, favorite hymns is Day by Day. Okay. And, you know, day by day and with, and with each passing moment, strength I find to meet my trials here. And it talks about how he uses the word tribulation in that. Um, because as Christians today, we're going to have to... We're trying to. We're having to live sometimes day at a time, day by day. So this gets perverted a lot, and some. And the other way they pervert it, they pervert it by saying the church is going through it when we're not. 
the, the doctrine of us, they take your eyes off Jesus Christ and get your eyes looking for the Antichrist. They'll deny it, but like I said, that's hypocrisy. You're either looking for Jesus Christ to come back or you're looking for the Antichrist to come back. You're not looking for both at the same time. I'm looking for Jesus Christ to come in the clouds. He doesn't come down to the earth. He comes in the clouds and calls me home. The catching away of the body of Christ. I keep my eyes on Jesus with the life that I'm living every day. And it's all about doctrines of devils. It's about taking your eyes off Jesus Christ and you're not going after Jesus Christ anymore. It's about the world. Now you've got to prepare for this seven year time period and so on and so forth. The other thing they do is I've heard people say the way that they turn this into doctrines of devils is they'll try to say that it already happened in the past. The seven year time period has already happened in the past and it's like, okay, then where's the thousand years that Jesus reigned? They have no answer for that. Jesus is supposed to, well they'll say that he, where does it say he does that? And we show them scripture, but like I said, it always comes back to that first doctrine we talked about. The doctrine of absolute truth. If they don't believe this is absolute truth, you're talking to a wall. It's pointless. Okay? But for us, we have absolute truth. Be wary when they try to change things. The biggest thing is, is they go outside the Bible. They'll change names. They'll change titles. They'll change definitions of things. To try to pull you away from going after Jesus Christ. And when you believe in the pre-time of Jacob's trouble, catching away the body of Christ, you're going out, you're keeping your eyes on Jesus Christ, and you're going after Jesus Christ every day with the life that you're living. And the doctrines of devils here, seducing spirits, it's all about sin for a season, to get your eyes off Jesus Christ and on the world. That's what it's all about. The next doctrine we're going to talk about just briefly is the doctrine of the Godhead. Absolute truth. Um... We're going to read all the mentions of the Godhead in the Bible. But first we're going to read 1 John 5, 3. What is the Godhead? For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. God the Father is the soul. Jesus is the body. He's the image. You can only see the body. You can't see a soul. You can't see a spirit. And you have the Holy Spirit is the spirit. Sometimes people say the Holy Ghost is the spirit. But these three are one person. Jesus is the person of the Godhead. For in Him, we're going to get into this, I was about to, um, Colossians 2.9, for in Him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Jesus is the person of the Godhead. Acts 17.29 says, for, for as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold, or silver, or stone, or graven by art, or man's devices. I got into this with David Daniels at Chick Publications. Jesus is the image of the Godhead. We're not supposed to have images of the Godhead. He's the expressed image of God. When if you were to draw, I'm just saying, if you were to be honest and say, okay, according to Scripture, we're doing the study, according to Scripture, I'm going to draw the image of the Godhead, it would be a picture of Jesus Christ. He's the image of the Godhead, and we're not supposed to do that. But there we see the word Godhead. Romans 1.20 For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead. We are created in the likeness of God. That's what that's talking about. Body, soul, spirit. What is the Godhead? Body, Jesus Christ. Soul, God the Father. Spirit, Holy Spirit. That's what this talked about, eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Colossians 2.9, we read that one. For in him dwelt the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Okay? Uh, doctrine, we have the Godhead doctrine, but also the doctrine goes into the one God doctrine. Remember what I said earlier? We're going to get ahead of myself a little bit again. <laughs> what do they like to do to get you away from the doctrine of God to doctrines of devils? They change the names. They change the titles. They change the definitions. In this case, they change math. Their math is just hypocrisy. <laughs> that's basically what it is. But there's one God. That's doctrine. There's not 
three gods that make up one God. There's just one God. 1 Corinthians 8, 6. But to us there is but one capital G God, the Father, for of whom are all things and we in Him, and one capital L Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things and we by Him. One capital G God, the Father. The soul is God. Jesus said, He that has seen me has seen the Father. He is the expressed image of God. The body is the image of God. You want to know what the image of my soul is? You're looking at it. It's my body. Jesus is God the Father. He said, If you see me, you have seen the Father. I and my Father are one. These three are one. But there's one capital G God, it's the Father. James 2.19 says, Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. Time and time again you read, one God, one God, one God. Okay? This is the doctrines of God that you're supposed to stand for. We're going to talk about how they like to pervert it. Okay? Jesus is the person, person of the Godhead. This is absolute truth. It's doctrine. Doctrines of God. We're going to read the four mentions of it. Job 13.6. Four mentions of it. I hope I got the Old Testament one right. Hear now my reasoning and hearken to my pleading of my lips. Will ye speak wickedly for God and talk deceitfully for God? Will ye accept His person, His being God the Father, person being Jesus Christ? And the old, let's keep going real quick and then we'll talk. His person, will ye contend for God? In the Old Testament, when you saw the Lord, He was a physical man sitting there talking, the angel of the Lord, or it just said the capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. A man was physically talking to another, like uh, Abraham. It was Jesus Christ. He was talking, that was God talking through Jesus Christ, the body. The soul was talking through the body. Nobody, we cannot be in the soul's presence because sin cannot be in God's presence. But Jesus is the body. Okay? So that person there is a reference to Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. Matthew 20, like I said, there's a huge study you can go on this. I'm just throwing these things out real quick for this study to show all these doctrines that are getting perverted. Okay, Jesus is the person of the Godhead. Matthew 27, 24. When Pilate saw that he could prevent nothing, but that rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. Jesus is called a person a second time. Ye see to it. See ye to it. It's the second time. 2 Corinthians 2.10 to whom ye forgave anything, I forgave also, for I forgave anything to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ. Remember we said if something's mentioned multiple times, it's important? Jesus has been called a person three times right now. Let's look at the fourth time. Hebrews 1.3 Who being the brightness of His glory and the expressed image of His person, and upholding all things by the word of His power, and when He had by Himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the Majesty on high. It says, and the expressed image of His person. His being God the Father, showing ownership. Who's the image of God? Jesus Christ. Person there is a reference to Jesus Christ again. Four times it's referred to Jesus as a person. Now the Bible definition, I did a whole study where I went through the whole Bible, I showed every verse that talked about, used the word person, it's a reference to somebody who has a body and a soul, and it's always a reference to somebody who's living, a spirit. The Bible definition for a person is you have to have a body, soul, and a spirit to be a person. Would we read, in Him dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily? Jesus is the body, God the Father is the soul, and uh, the Holy Ghost is the Spirit. And all of them reside in Jesus Christ. He is a person. That's why I say He is the person of the Godhead. Only Jesus Christ is. That's what the Bible teaches. Okay? How does this get changed into doctrines of devils? <laughs> pretty, pretty quick. Okay? 
You change the title. Remember we talked about, what do you do? You change the title. It's no longer Godhead, it's Trinity. They change the title. I did a teaching on this where I talked about how they start out with it's just Godhead, because that's what the Bible teaches, and you got snakes that sneak in. Remember what it tells? Get them out. When you find out they're false, get them out. But you got snakes that sneak in and say Godhead, and then after a while they say Godhead. Or there's this great way to explain it also. It's called the Trinity. It's just a way to explain it, but capital T Trinity. So we can get you to say Godhead, sometimes called the Trinity. And then after a while it's Godhead, also called the Trinity. Then you switch them around and say it's the Trinity, also called the Godhead, and eventually you just get to Trinity. Got rid of Godhead altogether. Nobody says Godhead anymore in these Babel buildings when they preach the Trinity. It's just the Trinity, 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 Trinity. They change the title of God. We've seen this already in some doctrines. That's how they get them over to doctrines of devils. You change the title. Okay? And now instead of God in one person, Jesus Christ, it's now in three persons. What do you do? You've got to change the definition of person. Person definition of the Bible says it's got to be a body, soul, and spirit. But you've got to change that definition now where it doesn't mean that. It just means consciousness. You have, to, you, know, you have some kind of a thought. You know. That's not what person is. They've got to change the definition. And now instead of one God, how they pervert it, now you've got three gods. Okay? And that's the biggest thing that they'll keep saying, no, we don't, we don't believe in three gods. God the Father, that's one, plus God the Son, that's two, plus God the Holy Spirit, that's three. That equals three. Remember the Holy Spirit's about truth, not deception, not riddles, not lies. One plus one plus one equals three, not one. You have multiple gods with the Trinity, period. You can't get away from it. The Bible says there's but one capital G, God the Father. God the Father is biblical. God the Son is not. God the Holy Spirit is not. There's only one God, and that's the Father. The soul is God, and Jesus is God because he has the soul in him, and they are one. The Holy Spirit is God because it's the Spirit of God. Okay. They have to change the definitions. They have to change the titles. Uh, turn to Exodus 20.30. Let this one sink in real quick. When they try to say, well, there's 1 plus 1 plus 1 equals 1. No, it equals 3. What does Exodus 23 say? Thou shalt have no other gods, plural, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, plural, before me, singular. Let that sink in. For those who still defend the Trinity, they might believe the Godhead of the King James Bible, but still defend using capital T Trinity as a title for God that's not found in Scripture. And as you see, for the most of these doctrines, how do they get you away from the Bible? They either pervert and twist the Bible, or they get you away from the Bible completely and it goes off in man's wisdom. But they change words, titles. Uh, they change words. They change definitions. But notice what it said there. Thou shalt have no other gods plural before me, singular. There's only one God, the Father. You'll have no other gods before me. Deuteronomy 5.7 says the same thing. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Okay. So we see that doctrine being perverted to doctrines of devils. They get you to worship the Trinity, the pagan Trinity, that's all about worshiping Satan, the beast, the false prophet, and the Antichrist. Okay, three persons. Because they are. They're three persons. They pervert the Bible. The next thing that I'm not going to go a lot in, there's a lot, uh, Brother Brian's done a lot of good studies on this one, is um, the doctrine of what the church really is. Okay, the doctrine is the church is the people. Time and time again, the church is the people, the church of Corinth. It's all the saved sinners that live in Corinth. It's not a building. So what do they do? They change the definition of church. And they get people to call a building a church, and it's no longer the people. 
and there's people that they will call the building I'm sorry but Peter Ruckman was one of them you listen to his studies he'll say one minute he'll say the church is the people the next minute he's calling that building a church then it's the people then it's the church then it's the people then it's the church what does the Bible say a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways now I'm not saying to brother uh, brother Brian brother um, Peter Ruckman had some good teachings, but when it came to the Babel building and putting on a show, he was pretty messed up a lot. I'm sorry, but he was. I'm watching some of his studies now, and I'm going, mm. and I'm, when it comes to his chalk talks, you want to learn some really good studies, read some of his books where it's just coming off scripture after scripture, and I'm going to be ordering some more of his books. Find some of his videos on questions and answers. Where he's sitting there with his Bible and someone asks him a question, he's telling him, flip here, flip there, and he's going through the Bible. I learned some amazing stuff from him through those videos. But these Chalk Talk videos, where he's in front of these Babel buildings putting on a show, it's not the same man. I'm sorry, it's just not. Okay? But you change the definition of church, and you get people to start worshiping a building. And you know the number one place that people get deceived in all these doctrines that we're talking about with seducing spirits and doctrines of devils these Babel buildings okay that one I just want to throw out real quick brother Brian does a lot of teachings on how church he went through all the words of church and how it's the people and how our bodies now is the temple for the Holy Ghost your body is a temple for the Holy Ghost I'm gonna get that one that one I should have had down First Corinthians six nineteen. What know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? That's why you gotta be careful. That's why the Bible talks about how fornication is destroying your body, your temple, when you fornicate. Whether it's with false gods or physically. Okay? You're destroying yourself. It destroys your body. Um, so church. Uh, is a doctrine. Why is that so important? Because if church is the people, the body of Christ, you're still going after Christ. You're holding the church accountable. You just preach the word and be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. That's not done to a building, it's done to saved sinners. Okay? Not a building, saved sinners. So that's another doctrine that keeps you on Christ. When, it, when you start going to these Babel buildings, I was a false convert for most of my life. I went to a lot of these Babel buildings. They start putting on the show. That's why I told you about, um, not that they're working miracles or not, but they put on, when people used to do the miracles, a lot of people came to see Jesus do the miracles. They didn't come for him himself. They came to see the miracles. A lot of people go to these Babel buildings for the atmosphere, the rock and roll music, okay, the the lunches, the camping, the, you know, whatever's, the social club. They're not coming because they're part of the body of Christ and they want to be fed and they want to live a life of Christ and they want to know this book and they want to know the Jesus out of this book. They like the Jesus that they preach in those Bible buildings, the Jesus, this counterfeit Jesus that's Satan of the world. It's okay with them just living however you want to live. You only have to be good while you're in church, which is one day a week. Well, if you go by the Bible, you're in church 24-7, you're supposed to live a life of Christ 24-7. You're supposed to be going after Jesus Christ 24-7. Okay? But they use uh, seducing spirits, definitely, in those Babel buildings. And they preach a lot of doctrines of devils. That's the best, and the, not the best like it's, I'm applauding it. I'm saying that's the most effective way I've seen today how people get messed up. Second is... YouTube, there's some people on YouTube that are trying to, uh, that are preaching false. But a lot of people on YouTube that preach a lot of the false doctrines, they have Babel buildings. Mm -hmm. Not all of them, but a lot of them do. The next doctrine that we're going to hit real quick, because we got to get through a lot of these, is hell, lake, and the lake of fire. Mm -hmm. Psalms 19.17 says, The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget God. We're going through these real quick. Psalms 139.8. Remember, you can always pause the video and then turn there and then unpause. If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. 
If I make my bed in hell, thou art there. I did a teaching on the glory of God. It manifests itself into three ways. Uh, light, cloud, and fire. Thou art there. The Holy Spirit is omnipresent. It's everywhere. You're going to, if you die in your sins, rejecting Jesus Christ, the real Jesus Christ, so you can have this world, even if you're a faker, like reprobate, the Bible calls, means you're fake, worthless, uh, pretending to be a Christian, but you're reprobate. You die and you go to hell to burn, you're going to burn for all, you toss the lake of fire to burn for all eternity. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is omnipresent. Sin can't be in God's presence, so you burn for all eternity. You will burn for as long as God exists. He's Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. He's everlasting. That's why you're going to be burning for all eternity. Paying for your sins for all eternity. Matthew 10, 28, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. People try to use that, say we're destroyed. No, it's constant destruction. You're not destroyed one, you're gone, annihilation. It's constant destruction for all eternity. You're burning for all eternity. When you're, something's burning, it's constantly being destroyed. Now, when we burn, I have a burn barrel. When I burn stuff in that burn barrel, it takes a while to burn. And then once it's burned, you got ashes. But when it's burning, it's being destroyed. It's not destroyed completely, but it's being destroyed. Revelation 20, 13. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and there, and they were judged every man according to their works. Remember, judge the seat of Christ is for safe sinners. The great white throne is for lost. Where everybody's going to be judged on their works. It's just that the judgment seat of Christ, we're not held accountable to the law of sin and death. Jesus paid for that price for us. At the right, great white throne, Jesus didn't pay the price for them. They're going to have to answer for it. Every man according to his work. And death and hell were cast into the lake of the fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. I forgot to add that verse. But we see that hell is real. Now, Matthew 23, 33. And this is the biggest reason why people pervert the doctrine of hell, what hell is. Okay? Ye serpents, ye generations of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? It's all about them trying to find their own way of getting out of hell. Okay? Giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. How does this get perverted? Hell does not exist. You have some people try to say hell doesn't exist. Some people say hell is the grave, annihilation, separation from God. Remember, the Holy Spirit's omnipresent, it's everywhere. We read that in Psalms. Okay. Burning, uh, see, burning for as long as God exists, I put that down. Light, cloud, flower, I already talked about that. Glory of the Lord. Uh, light, cloud, and fire is how it shows. So that disproves that. The Holy Spirit is everywhere. It's omnipresent. They say it's um, separation from God. Okay. Chapter and verse. It's just separation from God. Uh, there's burning. There's wailing and gnashing of teeth. Okay. Uh, read the story about the rich man and Lazarus. Okay. One thing they'll say is it's not like I said. It's just the grave. You know, once you die and you come up for judgment, you're annihilated and you disappear. It's like you never existed. Okay. There's no literal fire. Okay. Matthew 13, 24. Here disproves the literal fire part. I had to put this in there. I was watching one of Peter Ruckman's studies. It was really good. Matthew 13, 24. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which soweth good seed in the field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servant of the householder came and sowed said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in the field? Remember, this is a parable. From whence then he hath it tares. He saith unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he saith, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. 
Remember I did a study on this, tears lives matter. <laughs> no life matters without Jesus Christ. My life meant nothing. I was nothing without Jesus Christ. And people have to get to that point. Verse 30, let both grow together until the harvest, and in the time of harvest I will say unto the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. Now stop. Burn them. They'll say, well, it's metaphor. It's just a metaphor. And they're right. This first part of the telling of the story is a parable. He's using metaphors. But now go jump down to 36. Six verses down. Matthew 12. Is it 1236? Any second, I got something messed up here. Sometimes I do get things messed up. No, it's 13. Okay, 1336. Somehow I typed in 12. <laughs> but I want to make sure I was giving you guys the right scripture. So, if it is... 1836. Okay, so I put in 12 for some reason. <laughs> I can fix it later. But it's Matthew 12, uh, 13, 36. Jump down six verses. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went to the house, and his disciples came unto him, saying, Declare unto us this parable of the tares of the field. He's going to declare unto him. So what was a parable, metaphorically speaking, he's going to say what it really is. Verse 37, he answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man. That's not like metaphorically speaking. It's the Son of Man. Verse 38, the field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. It's not metaphorical, it's the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire. You mean the fire's fire? Burned means fire? It's, it's, he's talking literal fire? Yeah. So shall it be to the end of the world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Fire is fire. I love that teaching. It's like, that's a good one. Fire is fire. Okay. Here's another example to disprove them. Uh, they say it's just the grave. It's annihilation. Okay. There's no, we already disproved it. It's actual fire. So when they get tossed in, they're not just burnt up and annihilated. How do we know that? Uh, Revelation 19.20. People say they're not eternally burning. Uh, yeah, they are. Revelation 19.20 And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These boasts were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. At the end of the time of Jacob's trouble, that seven-year period, when Jesus starts his thousand-year reign, that's when they get tossed into the lake of fire, alive. They get tossed in the lake of fire. Okay. Now, turn to Revelation 20, 10. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the prof false prophet are. Not were, past tense. Present tense are. Every word that God uses, he uses for a reason. This is perfect written word of God. He chose the word are, present tense, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. It's eternal burning. But they come in and try to tell you it's just annihilation, it's the grave. They try to make people believe that there is no hell. They try to downplay hell. They try to get people not to even think about hell. Uh, when you think about hell, that's what gets you to look for Jesus Christ. The plan of salvation. I need to get saved. I don't want to go to hell and burn forever. It's a motivation for us, brothers and sisters in Christ, when we go to preach the plan of salvation, the ministry of reconciliation, to people we love and care about. To the world. We're supposed to love and care about the world, but you understand what I'm saying. It's a motivation for us. I don't want anybody to go to hell. It's how we keep our eyes on Jesus Christ and going after Jesus Christ. 
were motivated to preach the plan of salvation. I laid gospel tracts out. I hand gospel tracts out. Okay? But you got seducing spirits coming around and doctrine of the devils. Like I said, most of the people I talk to are professing Christians. They don't take hell that seriously. And where's the fear? Where's the fear of God? I don't even have that down as a, as a doctrine. Where's the fear of God? They try to take the fear of God away. They change the definition of the fear of God to be an actual fearing. Like I told you, they always change the title, the name, or the, the words, or the definition. Fearing God went from you had to actually fear God to now fear just means no, to knowing God. That's what I don't have down here. Okay, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. Fear God means simply that you have to have, the, by the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Okay, fear is fear. It's not knowing God, it's just knowing God. You know, it's not fearing God doesn't mean you have to be scared or anything. Oh, yes, it does. Fear him that's able to destroy both body and soul in hell forever, for all eternity, okay? So that would be a good doctrine I left out of this list. Sorry, it's just getting late. <laughs> um, we've got one more real quick, and then we'll end this section and then start part three. This part two is probably a little bit longer than, than all the others, but I pray, brothers and sisters Christ, you're still with me. Okay, the next doctrine, like I said, the doctrine I should have had here was doctrine of fearing the Lord. Okay, that's a big box. That's how you keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. When you take your eyes on Jesus Christ, you stop fearing Him, and you fall into sin, temptation, and you get into sin, and you start getting messed up. And God will chastise you like He did me. Seizure, that's scary. Seizure, I had found a whole pile of feathers for my uh, uh, rooster. Chastisement, the fear to get the fear back in me, and get my eyes back on Jesus Christ. So I start walking with Jesus Christ. Okay? That's a doctrine that they also doctrine of devils. If no longer you don't like, nobody fears God anymore. I hardly find it. I mean, you do, brother and sister in Christ, along with me, but I'm talking about when you go to preach the plan of salvation to the lost world and hell, you know, heaven and hell, there's just no fear of God. Another, the last one I put, I put on here, there's probably more, if, I, if you guys want to mention more that I didn't mention, doctrines that keep your eyes on Jesus Christ that I didn't mention, by all means go ahead and mention it. But the last one I put in there is holy days. Keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. That's with all those holy days in the, in the Old Testament. Holy days and Sabbath days were about keeping your eyes on Jesus Christ. It was to help them remember what Jesus did for them and keep their eyes and their life when I say keep, remember when I say keep your eyes on Jesus Christ, it's living for Jesus Christ. That's what keep your eyes on Jesus Christ is. Colossians 2.16 Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath day, which are shadows of things to come, but the body is of Christ. There we see holy day. What's a holy day? A holy day is simply this. It's a God-ordained day to keep your eyes on Him. He ordains it. He tells you what it is, how to keep it, when to keep it, and the consequences for not keeping it. That's what a holy day is. Okay? Now, Romans 14, 15. People will try to use this, and we'll talk about the perversion here in a second, but Romans 15, 14. One man esteemeth one day above another. Uh, and, let's see, one man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be per fully persuaded in his own mind. Now they'll have you believe, this is talking about any day. Just any day of the week, any day for anything, for any reasons. No, keep reading. Verse 6, He that regardeth the day, the day regardeth it unto the Lord. What are holy days? It's days that we regard to the Lord to keep your eyes on Jesus Christ to keep people going after Jesus Christ, including the Sabbath day. Okay. That's what's going on here. Regardeth unto the Lord. And he that regardeth not the day, to the Lord he doth not regard it. Talking about holy days. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord. For he giveth thanks, and he that eateth not, to the Lord he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. Some of those holy days were feast days. It was about eating. I mean, right there also ties in with it. It's about eating, comparing Scripture with Scripture. Okay. Verse 7, For none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. 
For whether we live, we live unto the Lord. And whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. You can choose to keep some of the feast days, the holy days, and the Sabbath day. That's up to you. If you want to do it, fine. If you don't want to do it, fine. It, regardless, every day of the week, we all belong to the Lord. Every day of the week, we're supposed to keep our eyes on Jesus Christ and going after Jesus Christ. But if you want to keep some of the holy days and the feast days and the Sabbath days, go ahead. If you don't, you don't have to. How is that getting perverted today? Well, you have some people coming in, Dr. Zadell is telling you, you have to keep them to be saved. I didn't put those verses down here. Um, but, um, I'm trying to think in my head, but I can't think of it. But um, there was people t uh, judging, why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? I think it's in 1st uh, or 2nd Corinthians. And what's going on there is they're telling people that you, ha you can only eat certain meats. Okay, but there's uh, Galatians, they're saying uh, there's people coming in to spy out your liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus. So you have people coming in telling them that you have to keep the holy days and the Sabbath day in order to be saved. And if you don't keep them, you're not saved. That's perverting the doctrine and turning it into a doctrine of devils. You don't have to keep those days anymore. Okay? The body of Christ does not have to keep those days. Um, but what, like I always tell you, what do they do? They change the def, they change the title, they change the word, words sometimes, and they'll change the definition. Okay, so they change the title from holy day to holiday. Well, what is holiday? Ho and they change the definition. Holiday is actually a man ordained day. Holy day, God ordained. Holiday, man ordained. And most of the time you get into holidays that are man-ordained, they're about worshiping false gods. Easter, Halloween, Christmas, those are the three biggest ones. It's about worshiping false gods. And they always try to Christianize it to make it look Christian or make it look innocent and good. But there's a different meaning. There's hidden meanings. Christmas, the summer solstice. Uh, Easter, was, I think the winter solstice. Um, it's you have to look into it, but it's like Ishtar, Easter, um, and then Halloween, Samhain. You know, it's very wicked. These holidays, they're man ordained. But what does Exodus twenty three say? We read, uh, "Thou shalt have no other gods before me." And you've got Christians that are still defending some of these holidays, and they're trying to make it Christ, uh, make it Christian, but you can't make something that's about worshiping false gods Christian. Okay, what happens? They change it from holy day to holiday. And they take that verse, Romans 14, 15, one man esteemeth one day above another, one man esteemeth every day alike, let every man be persuaded in his own mind. They stop right there. Any day. If you want to celebrate Easter, go for it. You want to celebrate Halloween, go for it. You want to celebrate Christmas, go for it. And, you know, Mother's Day, Father's Day, this day, that day. It's just, it's monotonous. A lot of, uh, half the days that we have in our calendar is holidays. A lot of them are based off pagan religions. And I wouldn't be surprised if the other half are too. But the other half are based off of making money. Mother's Day. I, my mom's a mother every day of the week, every day of the month, <laughs> every day of the year. There's no one day that she's a mother. So it's, it's engineered to make money. Okay, the love of money is the root of all evil. Um, Acts 12.4 and when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quarter, quarter let's see, I can't even pronounce that for some reason, maybe I spelled it wrong, portions of soldiers to keep him, extent, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Easter, talking about John the ba uh, Baptist. Oh gosh, now my brain's... It's getting late. We're almost done. <laughs> I didn't put a lot down on this one. But bottom line, it, that's where you hit. I, I put that in there because it mentions Easter. Okay? But Easter back then in the Bible, it shows that the Jews didn't celebrate Easter. Pagans did. Now, look into that a little bit more. But pagans 
celebrate Easter. I just wanted to show that, yeah, Easter is in the Bible, but it's paganism. It's not a holy day. It doesn't fall under a holy day or Sabbath day at all. I mean, and then I put on here people that have been corrected and been showed Scripture. Everything that we just talked about, all the doctrines, when people that have been corrected and showed Scripture after Scripture after Scripture for these doctrines, they still go for doctrines of devils. Why is that? Remember what 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2 said, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. That's why. They don't have a love of the truth. Most of them are fake. They're false. And the few that aren't, they've fallen away. They've given in heed to uh, seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. They've become spoiled by philosophy and vain deceit after the rudiments, after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world. And it's not after Christ. It's after the world. Everything we just read there, rudiments of the world. Okay, traditions of men, the wisdom of men. It's after the flesh. It's so they can have sin for a season. Anytime you see people take a doctrine and screw it up, it's so they can have sin for a season. They are not going after Jesus Christ. They're going after the flesh every time. People say, we're screwing up the doctrines. We have it wrong. We're about going after Jesus Christ. Keeping your eyes on Jesus Christ. He can come back any day now. That's what we're about. And we preach it from the Word of God. And we show Scripture. Like I said, I'll link all the playlists to a lot of these studies. Time and time and time again. Okay? We show scripture after scripture after scripture, study after study after study, and people will deny the doctrines, the true doctrines of God, for doctrines of devils. Why? Because their conscience is seared with the hot iron. They've been seduced by, uh, they, they've given heed to seducing spirits that lead you to doctrines of devils, and those seducing spirits will always use sin to, as the, to entice you, the flesh to entice you, and pull you away from looking after, going after Christ and looking at Jesus Christ, to looking at the world. So this study was a little bit longer for part two. We'll get into part three. I'll get these two videos out tonight, or uh, try to, and we'll get out uh, the third part I'll get into tomorrow. But we're going to start talking about, um, we're going to talk about marriage. So the next part might be short, but marriage and uh, forbidden to eat meats. Okay. So, um, Grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. I didn't do this in part one, but I don't know when I'll get to part three. So grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. My love for you, which is in, in Christ Jesus, after Christ Jesus, in Christ Jesus our Lord. I'm trying to point you after Jesus Christ, not me, Jesus Christ, His Word. My love for you, brothers and sisters in Christ, you're truly saved. If you're lost, my love for you is I don't want you going to hell. If you're saved, my love for you is I don't want all I don't want a lot of your works getting burnt up at the judgment seat of Christ. I'm already afraid of that, that a lot of my works I struggled, had a hard time when I first newly got saved, and I'm still even as a saved sinner making mistakes. And I pray that when I get to the judgment seat of Christ, that I've that God will look at me and say, Well done, thou good and faithful one, that he'll be pleased with me and won't be disappointed in me. And that's my love for you, brothers and sisters of Christ. When I point you to say, make sure you're going after Jesus Christ, it's because of love. It's not me being mean and me trying to put myself above you and I'm better than you. No, I'm still trying to go after Jesus Christ too every day and keep my eyes on Him and not failing like I did recently. Okay? So, we'll see you in part three.